So, hello. Hello. First off, thank you for having Ampi Book Club here at the Tucson Festival of Books and for allowing us to interview some amazing authors. And a big thank you to you, Ms. Uh, Ayana Jay. Yes. Uh, for coming here to talk with us. We all absolutely loved your book, and it's really just an honor for you to have, for us to have you here. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. This is my first time in Tucson, and I've loved it. So, my name is Mia. Uh, my first question is, which character do you believe is most like you? Oh, well, nice to meet you, Mia. Um, I think there's parts of me in all of my characters. I probably relate the most to Ekon. He has anxiety, he has OCD, he doesn't like when we deviate from the plan and gets in it and just is, he freaks out when that happens. Um, and he loves books. He's, his happy place is like a library. And so those are all things that I really relate to. So probably I come. Um, hello, my name is Estrella. And Ooh. my first question, well, first of all, um, I love this, all the scenes with um, coffee. So what was the, top process when you were creating coffee? Ooh, well, I think that, and this is just from personal experience, I find that black girls and, and more widely women of color are often forced to kind of soften themselves to be palatable in the bigger world. And so when I was writing Kofi and also several other characters in the story, I really wanted to write a black girl who was unapologetic and, and really fierce and also has some, you know, some di like dimension and has her moments of gentleness and softness, but really it was just like, here I am and I'm not softening myself or making myself more palatable. So that's, that was kind of the mindset I had when I was writing her. I'm glad you like her. She's kind of a mess. <laughs> <laughs> like me, so I identify with her. Also just not perfect. I think too, YA fantasy, you have these teens who like are super together and coordinated and never awkward and always know what they're doing. And I'm like, that's not how I was when I was a teenager. So I wanted to be true to that. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was really nice. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name oh. is Shida. Hello. And I really, like, first off, I want to say how pretty you are. Oh, thank you. And I love your, like, dress. Thank you. Um, but um, <laughs> my question is, um, what made you give Ekon OCD? And yeah, what made you give him OCD? You know, um, so I knew when I started writing Beasts of Prey that it was gonna be the two POVs. I, I knew kind of who Ekon and Kofi were. Um, black boys, and I have a little brother, so this is from very personal reference. Um, I don't, growing up, I did not see black boys get to be gentle and soft. Like a lot of times black boys and even boys of color in general, um, are like hyper masculine and really tough all the time. And my little brother was the kid who liked Thomas the Tank Engine. Like he likes to build things. He was not like necessarily super rough and tough. And I watched in school how he would not always be accepted. Um, and so when I was creating Ekon, like Ekon is not exactly like my brother, but I wanted to write a character to say, hey, those black boys exist. And then as I was writing Ekon, and getting into his head, um, you know, it, it really kind of came organically. And I realized like, I'm writing him as anxious because this is again, like I, I relate to that. I, I have anxiety and a little bit of OCD. And um, sometimes like your characters surprise you, which is weird because you're controlling, it's it's all from your head, but you're, you're writing from places that are personal and putting that piece of yourself into it without even realizing it. And then after the story is done, you look back and you're oh, wow, I, I put a piece of myself into this book because I hadn't seen it in a, another fantasy book before. So it was kind of an accident, but it was also me being truthful. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name Hi. is Aranza, and my question is, my favorite character is Kofi. Mm -hmm. So do you have any favorite character? Ooh. Um, it's hard to pick a favorite because I created them all and I love them all for different reasons. And in, in, there are different characters in different books. Um, obviously, Ekon has a soft, like, has this place in my heart. I really liked Adia just because, you know, she's even fiercer than Kofi. And there's a moment in Beasts of Prey, sorry if there's spoilers, where she, like, gets in trouble at school and she's like, it wasn't my fault. Like, he, he antagonized me, you know? And like, I was, I just wasn't that brave kid in school. And so getting to write a girl who was all the things I wished that I was when I was 16 or 17 felt really good. So it's like, I feel bad saying Adia. I love them all though, but okay. I'm going to say Adia 
and I'll probably regret it later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Mara. Hi. Um, I really loved how you, like, playfully made the, the creatures. Mm -hmm. What was your thought process and references that you used to... For the creatures. To create the creatures. Yeah. So I, probably to no surprise, I was a fantasy reader as a kid, and I also really liked <laughs> mythology. But I only knew about Greek slash Roman mythology because that's all I was exposed to. And Greek, you know, Greco-Roman mythology has a lot of great lore. It is fun to read. But when I found out that there were mythologies from other parts of the world, I was even more excited. Because I remember, like, in high school, I drew the Greek pantheon, so Zeus, Hera, Poseidon. I drew them as black one time because I was like, I just so desperately wanted to see people who looked like me get to have that lore and that mythology. Then when I found out, oh, you don't have to do that. We, there's already lore and mythology from other parts of the world and from different parts of Africa. Um, I was really excited. And then I found out that there were all these monsters and all these creatures from that lore. And I was like, why are there not any fantasy novels about these creatures? Like, this is really cool to me. Um, so people ask me, like, did you make them up? And I'm like, I, I didn't. I actually pulled them from mythology. And in the back of each book, you know, I have the notes about where they where they come from. And if you want to know more, um, because when I was reading as a kid, like, that's what I would do is go immediately Google, like, if I read about something cool. Um, so, yeah. And I, you know, I love Steve Irwin, Crocodile Hunter. I know that's old now, but I was that kid in the 90s who liked, like, animal shows, Wild Thornberries, that show about the girl that could talk to animals. And Studio Ghibli. Like, I just have a huge soft spot for animals. If you all have seen Princess Mononoke, it's one of the more violent Studio Ghibli movies, but like, huge, huge influence on me as like a creative. So like, if you see bits of Princess Mononoke, no, you didn't. You did not see it. <laughs> um, <coughs> but yeah, that's a super long answer to say. I just, it's wish fulfillment for me. It's just stuff that I, that I really enjoy. Can you get some more? Sorry. <clears throat> yeah. Hi, my name is Natalie. Hello. I wanted to know if you thought it was really good. And mm. I really liked it and find everything out. Thank you. When did writing get full full time serious for you? Say again? When did writing get full time serious for you? Oh. Full time series. Um, so I started Beast to Prey in May twenty fifteen right when I finished college and I graduated and didn't have a plan and was like scared because I'm like what if I don't have it all figured out what if I fail and so I wrote for fun just as like a fun exercise like I can escape to this magical world I've created um and I wrote for four years like on and off not consistently and I got a full-time like day job and I would write at night and then finally I found a, a Twitter event where you could pitch your book on Twitter and if agents liked it then you could send it to them. And that's how I actually got my book deal and my agent through Twitter. So the moral of that story is shoot your shot. Like you, sometimes you've got to put yourself out there. Um, but I was the whole time that was happening. And even after I got my agent, um, I, I was still working. So I would go to work eight to five, come home, eat dinner really quick. And then I would write into the night on weekends. I would write like I really, I didn't have any social life because actually when you graduate from college, like no one tells you, it's really hard to find friends because you don't have school anymore as like a natural community. So I was like pretty alone in my early twenties. So anyway, then the pandemic happened. I was working virtually from home. It was miserable. Um, I sold my books, but I actually waited and kind of made a financial plan for myself to say, do I have enough money to pay my rent, to pay for my food and, and whatever else I needed um, and planned it out really carefully. So I didn't become full-time until May of 2021, a few months before Beasts of Prey came out. So I was, I waited, but it's, it is possible. You just have to kind of, you know, you, you plan and you budget and make sure that you have enough money to do that. It's been almost three years. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, my name is Reva and I want Hello. to ask you what part of your life influenced you to write this book? Ooh, um, I'm not one of those cool authors that has like a dream, you know, and wakes up and had from the dream. And I'm like, I, I have the whole story. I, if you think about like building a fire, which I've only built a fire a few times, but you know, you have to have like kindling you, you pull, and it gets bigger and you add to it to get it to, and that's kind of how my, my writing and inspiration goes. So, um, I went to Ghana, a West African country about the size of Oregon for perspective. Um, uh, for study abroad in college. And it was my first time abroad, first time traveling really outside of America. 
And Ghana is not a big country, but it has so much in it. It has, you know, in the northern area, these deserts that kind of border the Sahara. Um, you have these beautiful forests. You have huge cities, little villages. It's just there's so much packed into this country that's not that big. And there's also a ton of history when you talk about, like, decolonization and pan-Africanism. Um, and when I went, I remember thinking, why are there not more fantasy novels set in worlds that look like this? Because there's so much here. This is such a beautiful, rich country. Um, so that was kind of like the initial, kind of got me thinking. Um, I took a course in college called Political Violence, where we like, it was very secret history, if you guys have read that book, where we met like once a week in a tower <laughs> for three hours. And my professor would just ask us these ridiculous, hard questions about political violence and terrorism. And what I learned from that was good and evil are very easy to manipulate based on who has power. You can turn someone into a monster or a hero or a villain based on just who has the power and who has a voice and who doesn't have a voice. So that was in my head. And then I also learned about the Sabo man eaters. If you guys have any of you heard of the Sabo man eaters, there's a movie about them. Um, the short, short version is the British wanted to build a railroad back when they'd colonized East Africa between Uganda and Kenya. It was going to be like one of the biggest in industrial feats of the time. They hired all of these workers to build these to build this massive railroad, intercountry uh, railroad. And they started, but then these two male lions, male lions don't normally hunt together. They started to um, kill the workers. They come in at night in their tents and drag them out and kill them. What was scarier, besides the fact that males don't normally hunt, um, they were by themselves. They weren't killing for food. They were killing for the blood sport. And it got so bad that eventually the workers were like, we're going to quit. We're not trying to be out here. We're not trying to die for the railroad. Um, so they hired um, a man, ironically named Remington, uh, to come. And he did eventually capture the, he killed both of the lines. They were brothers. Um, but he struggled to do it. And to this day, they're at the Chicago Field Museum. They've been taxidermied. But to this day, scientists don't really understand why they were killing these workers. And... Um, the locals named them the ghost and the darkness. And it was their, the lore that they created was that those were the spirits of two chiefs who were angry that the railroad was being built. Does this sound like Princess Mononoke to anyone? <laughs> um, inter interfering with nature. Anyway, um, so there, Remington, the guy that, the, the man that ended up killing them, he wrote this best-selling book about the experience, right? But there's no accounts about the workers and you have to imagine, like, you've just done this hard labor, building a railroad, you go into your tent at night to rest, but then you hear the next tent over, your fellow co-worker being dragged out to the night, screaming, and, like, there's no account of what that was like and the fear, how that would have just consumed you. And I remember thinking that was kind of a loss, and what would it be like if you had that kind of fear, but a whole city had that kind of fear? Um, and that's kind of where Lakosa, which is where Beasts of Prey is set, kind of formed. And what, what would the response be? Would there be an elite warrior group that would probably try to defend the city? And, you know, it, and it kind of, what if, what if, what if, and it blossomed from there. So, big, sorry, like I said, it's never one thing with me. It's always little pieces, but, you know, I'm thinking about Ghana. I'm thinking about power and monsters and storytelling and the Savo man eaters and all of it's kind of coming together. And that's how Beasts of Prey formed. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Jaden. Hi. And I wanted to know when you write a story, does it become like the deadline? Does it become stressful for you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Beasts of Prey was probably least stressful because I was writing it for myself. No expectations. I mean, it took forever and I didn't know if it would ever be published. Um, but the characters were just mine and no one knew about it. And Beasts of Room was my first book to write, like, with a contract, with a hard deadline, and also people were reading Beasts of Prey and leaving reviews, and I was trying to avoid those. So the beginning's always the most fun part, because you're inspired and going. The middle's always hard, and the, the uh, I do four acts, so the third and fourth act are kind of like you, it's like panic, and then you come down from it, and then you're like, it's out of my hands now. <laughs> it is always stressful, but it's also always really satisfying when it's when it's done. And I think just doing a little bit a day, like I don't tell myself, finish the book. I tell myself, finish the scene, finish the chapter, finish that conversation and kind of look at it like in little kind of small scale instead of being intimidated by the whole book or the whole series. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jesse. And Hello. Um, what aspects of your own book do you find most challenging to explore as a writer? Ooh. 
Um, the world building is always easiest. I love building worlds and having all the magic and the rules that I, cause I, I get to make it all up. Um, I think learning who my characters really were, um, cause I'm in their heads and especially Ekon, he's a boy. I'm not a boy. So I don't, I mean, I had to kind of switch gears and think like not necessarily what I would always do, even though we have a lot in common. Um, Ekon presents as this really tough, like, you know, elite warrior and he does have these skills, but that's not really who he is. So Kofi is seeing him as he presents himself, but then you switch POVs and you're in his head and you know what he's really thinking. And so balancing like who he's pretending to kind of be in the beginning of the series versus who he is on the inside in that internal battle. Um, it took me a while before, like a few different attempts before I got to like, this is who Ekon really is and this is how he's going to grow throughout the series. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Patience. Hello. I was wondering what was your inspiration to pick the certain mythologies in Pan-Africa, knowing there is so much of a wide variety of it? Yeah. Um, you know, I I wish I had a super sophisticated answer, but it was really like, is this cool to me? Like, does this make my brain light up? And I know there's West African inspired fantasy. I know that there's North African, East, and they, these are distinct separate regions of, of the African continent. Um, but because I am descended from people taken from all parts of Africa, it kind of was a cool homage to saying like, I don't know exactly where, but I want to honor the continent and honor the different lores and the different mythologies because, because I don't have that specificity. Um, and I had a few people say, oh, West African. And I would say, no, it's not just West African. It's, it's definitely not. And really pushed to say actually Central African, Southern African, Northern and Eastern, like it's actually pan on purpose because not to get into a huge lecture about it, but Pan-Africanism was a real movement from the sixties that encouraged, um, you know, kind of divided we fall, united we stand. Decolonization worked because the European powers were, were you know, creating division among different countries and different ethnicities in Africa. And the whole Pan-African movement was, we're not focusing on what divides us, we're focusing on the things that unite us. Whether we are in Africa, whether we're in the Caribbean, whether we're in America, we are still united by the shared identity as black people. So kind of, I don't know if that answers the yeah. question, but that's that's kind of why. Thank you. So I'm, I'm a big romance fan. Yes. And I really loved how your the romance in the story Thank you. really flowed mm -hmm. along with like the world building and stuff. So I was just wondering, did you follow any guidelines when you were writing the romance in Beast of Prey? Uh, one, my grandma's going to read this. <laughs> so <laughs> my grandmother's a retired librarian, so it's like, it, it, the spice has to be <laughs> like level one. Um, <laughs> and also, okay, so I grew up with like the, the YA boom. Hunger Games, Maze Runner, Divergent, um, the last Harry Potter book, like all those were coming out when I was a teen. It was a really cool time to be a teen because you felt like so many big books were like for you, for your age group. And I love these books, but one thing that frustrated me about some of them was the, I just met you yesterday, but I would die for you. And I'm like, what? Like that doesn't make sense. That's, that's not a good thing to like teach 16, 17, 13, 14 year old kids, like that you would die for someone you just met or you, you can't possibly be in love with someone you don't even know. Um, so I, that was a deliberate choice I made. And I know like instant love is a fun trope. I'm not here to bash it. It's just like, I know that it, it harmed me as a teenager and my expectations and what I thought was normal as a teenager, like that you could possibly be in love with someone you just, you just met, you don't even know them. So Kofi and Akon, um, especially in Beasts of Prey, like there's a moment when Akon's like, I really like her. I don't, it's not love because I don't know her yet, but I really like her and I hope that it becomes something more. Um, there's also just not a lot of like romance scenes from the perspective of the guy. It's often the girl and I, I wanted to subvert that. So there wasn't a specific guy and I just knew what I did and did not want to see in a teen romance. Also these like super competent teens that know exactly what to do. It's like, no, if you, your first kiss is usually awkward. Like it's not this coordinated Disney movie thing. It's usually super awkward and weird. Um, and I wanted to capture that, like just trying to be like a genuine teenager and like what I remember about being a teenager. So I don't know if I got it right, but I tried. Because <laughs> I, I really found it very realistic, so oh, thank I, you. I absolutely enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Getting off my soapbox about it. But yeah, instant love bugs me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to know, like, if 
did any movie or TV show influence the story progression? Um, so definitely from Just Modern Okay. I mentioned that before. Um, I was still writing it when Black Panther came out. Now, Black Panther is um, Afrofuturistic. It's more sci-fi, I would say. But just to see, like, a, a whole, like, Black-centered world in this kind of... And I, I feel like the, the uh, Marvel movies are kind of side fantasy. Like, they kind of are a bit of both, like, visually seen. That was really encouraging while I was writing them. So, yeah. All Studio Ghibli, just we'll say all Studio Ghibli too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what inspired you for the world building in Beasts of Prey? Ooh, um, so I talked about Ghana, um, and just again, like it's really cool how it's not a big country, but there's so much as far as like this landscape, and just I mean, I could tell anecdotal stories about some of the people I met and the stories they told me, but I, I think. Going to Ghana was life changing for me and just getting to get out of America and see a, a country where blackness was the norm and was the standard and not othered. That was really important for me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is the significance of the title Beasts of Prey and how do you decide that it was the final title? So it was Beasts of Prey. When we tried to t sell it to publishers, we changed it to Beast Keeper, or my agent changed it. and I. I went with it for that time, but then I ended up saying, you know, I don't like that because it focuses on Kofi and it totally takes Ekon out and half the story is his. Um, so it's Beasts of Prey and there's a line in the book that has beasts. I like when like the title appears in the text. That's just the thing I like as a reader. Kofi and Ekon are hunting a monster, but they're also kind of running from their own monsters internally. And part of what they learn is running from your monsters doesn't actually make them go away. It's about facing them. And usually they're not as bad as what you think. And that's like, for them, it's, it's these, you know, internal monsters. But for me, in, when I was 17, it was like college exams. It was, um, where do I, what do I do with my life? Like I was running from these things and not, not facing them. So that's kind of, it speaks to the kind of the message of the, the books for me. It's just not running from the, the beasts of prey. Um. I wanted to know, do you prefer to write what you read or based on trends? Ooh. Um, I think my best writing comes from writing like what makes me excited. And if it happens to be trendy, great. But if it's not, kind of go well. Because, I don't know, I could write to trend up to a point. But if it's just not exciting to me, I think you can tell. Like when I'm just not interested anymore and the truth is I like monsters and I like mythology and that's just my jam it always has been and it I don't know it's hard to explain but when, like I say my brain lights up and I'm just going 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 because I'm genuinely excited as a reader and as a writer and as a creative person so it's a bit of both and I'm kind of like if it happens to be trendy great but if not I'm still probably going to write it like there's some stuff I probably could never write because it doesn't excite me it might excite someone else but I'm not going to force it Are you a pantser or a plotter? Ooh, um, I feel like it's more of a spectrum. Like I know a lot of writers will say I'm a pantser or I'm a plotter. I think more times than not, it tends to be a spectrum, and you kind of fall somewhere on it. So I mostly plot, but I leave a little bit of room for myself to be surprised, and that way, if I want to change a little thing, it doesn't totally mess up my outline. So mostly plotting. But I do leave a little bit of creative space for myself. And sometimes, you know, I'll make a change that does cause me to have to totally replot. But I always tell myself it's if it creates a better version of the book, it's worth it. Thank you for asking that. I want to ask if uh, there are any points in your in writing be so great. Was there like you got frustrated to the point you don't want to write anymore or just start over again? Did I mention that it took me four years? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I didn't write it for four years straight. I wrote it. I'd get lost or frustrated because I didn't know about plotting yet, and I was trying to pants it. Um, and I would put it away for a few months, and then I would keep thinking about it, and then come back, and then try it again, and then put it away, and then come back to it. Um, when I found out about the DV Pit event on Twitter, that was the first time I was like, okay, I have to finish. I can't keep trying to rewrite and be perfect. I just need to finish it in time for this pitching event. And that's, I don't know if you got, like, for writers, um, if you all are into writing, 
Trying to write a perfect first draft is a mistake. Sometimes you just have to let yourself do it badly, write the messy, ugly duckling draft. And then it can always get better. You can't make a blank white page better, but you can make a first draft better, and a second, and a third, and a fourth, however many you need. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that is. Hopefully that answered the question. Oh, well, writing it, uh, was there a part where you got stuck like, the exact moment where Um, I think my editor, once I sold the books, um, she pointed out, like, things that, like, world-building questions that I sort of had to reconcile with, like, the timeline. And in those moments, I do what's called soundboarding, where I'll call a friend or my editor or my agent and just talk out the problem. And so, and they'll ask me questions like, why are you making it so complicated? Why don't you just have them get from point A to point B? Why are you throwing in Q, X, and Y? And I'm like, I don't know. Actually, they can't just go here to here. Um, but yeah, I find talking it out is usually the way I can un, un I, I call it plot knots, so untangle plot knots. Be cute. Yeah. Are there specific themes or messages you're made to convey through your writing? Um, again, I always want, I want black kids to have stories that aren't just about overcoming racism and oppression. I think those stories are important and do have a place in our, in our libraries and our bookstores, but I also don't think those should be the only stories. Um, I, especially when I write in YA, I want teens to know um, that love is not conditional. It's not something that you have to earn. Um, find people who accept you as you are. You shouldn't have to change yourself to fit in with friends or, you know, they shouldn't like you after you've changed who you are. Um, and then, yeah, not, you know, I mentioned it before, but not running from your monsters, learning to face your fears, face the things that scare you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, what does your typical day of writing look like? Um, so it's changed because I have a puppy now and a spouse. Um, so I get up, I walk my dog because she, I have a doodle if any of you have doodles or understand doodle life. It's a, it's a lifestyle. Um, she acts completely different, uh, differently based on whether or not she gets a walk. So we go on a nice big walk. She comes home, she's tired, she curls up on the couch and I go in my office, shut the door, um, and I put my headphones on, white noise, brown noise, pink noise, and I write for about three hours. Um, and when I say write, I'm not like for three hours, I'm just focused, you know finish the scene, finish the chapter, whatever it is. Um, and then at 12 o'clock, I stop and have lunch. I've learned that my brain turns to mush at like 12, one o'clock. I just, I don't force myself to write at a time that my brain is just not on. So I take a break. I might answer emails or do other things that are related to my job that aren't writing. And then I'll pick it back up kind of late afternoon, evening when my brain turns back on and do a little more writing. Um, and then dinner and then go to bed. Okay. Just a little bit every day. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. So in Beasts of Prey, you switch between Adias? Adia, yeah. Adias mm -hmm. uh, era, and then uh, Ekans and Kofis. Mm -hmm. uh, what were you trying to achieve for like the readers when jumping between timelines? Yes. So again, I think it's a little personal in that like as an, as an African-American woman, I know that like I exist, not to be too existential here, but I exist because of decisions my ancestors made. Um, the choice to survive despite incredible hardship and brutality. And I think even, not even going up that far back, I think about stories from my great, one of my great grandmothers is from Barbados. Um, and the choice she made to come to America. And I just, I'm, I get really in my head when I think about how one individual's choice can literally shape a destiny hundreds of years later. And I think that's really interesting to think about and how Adia's choices affect, she's not necessarily related to Kofi, but her choices have affected the fates of two people she never, like she does meet them, but you know, in a totally different era. And I, I just thought that was a cool thing to think about with fate and destiny. Mm -hmm. um, I want to know which character was the most hard to write? Ekon, because he's a boy. <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, I, I mentioned before, he is layered. What, who he presents is not always who, what's going on internally. So trying to find the truth there was, was sometimes hard. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Um, in the beginning of the book, this quote was stated, sometimes though you can't eat with your heart, you have to think with your head. Mm -hmm. And 
what made you like what made you have this hope and how is it how is it significant to you in any way oh I think it's it's significant to me like on a personal level because that was kind of the thing I had to battle as a teenager um I remember like when I think about being a teenager, which was now like I'm turning 31 in a few days, but like I think about it being an incredibly emotional period in my life. Like every, it wasn't just, I don't like her. It was like, I hate her, I loathe her. And it wasn't just, I'm happy. I was euphoric, I was delighted. Like, you know, every emotion was big. And one of the struggles I had as a teenager was like balancing those huge emotions with also using rationale and thinking through decisions and taking sometimes my emotion out of it. Um, and learning, you know, but sometimes it's okay to have emotion and, and not close yourself up. So kind of just an homage, like not an homage, a kind of like a nod to how I remember feeling as a teenager and the struggle I felt with balancing those, those two really big competing things in my head and my heart. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any specific challenges you face while writing Beast of Prey and how did you learn um, with Beasts of Prey specifically. Um, I think the biggest was, you know, the existential, does this even matter? Because I didn't have a book deal. I didn't have an agent. I didn't know what would happen. And just being like, is this too weird? Like, is anybody going to like this? Does this matter? Even though I really love it, um, you know, maybe this is bad. Maybe I shouldn't share it. And, you know, having to kind of overcome that and get over the fear of sharing with people and deal with rejection and people who don't like it. Um, that's, yeah, that's still a hard thing, even three books in, um, cause it's a piece of myself that you're putting out into the world and, um, I don't know, it's, yeah, it, it never gets easy to do that. Sorry, I got in my head a minute, but a bit there, like with, I mean, it started out with just critique partners, but then it was agents and then it was publishers and now it's readers. And if they're like, I don't like that, you feel like they're saying, I don't like you, even though that's not what they're saying. Um, but it requires a bit of like vulnerability that's kind of scary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how old were you when you started writing? Nine. Oh. Writing, like not well, <laughs> just <laughs> writing. And a lot of it was like fanfic of like whatever I was watching at the time. Like there's some stuff that's very reminiscent of Teen Titans because that's what I was into at one point. Um, <laughs> Beast of Prey is the first book I've ever finished. And I was, oh, I started it when I was 22. I think I finished it when I was 26. So like lifetime of writing, but I didn't finish anything till 26. Did I answer? Yeah. Okay, good. You good. In the book, is there anything that you had but changed? Like, mm. That's hard for me to answer because I'm like, it's weird. I know some authors keep like, I'm, I'm weird in that once I've changed it, I like remove it from my brain. Um, oh, I think in an early, early, early draft, like circa 2015, I had a Royal family and I had a Prince um, and I really loved him, but it just like, I made some big changes um, to the plot. And once I made those changes, he wasn't needed anymore. So someday I will write him somewhere else like I've not gotten rid of him but um yeah now I'm now I'm like remembering him oh my gosh because like I truly cut like I remove him from the story and then I'm like he doesn't exist anymore but I'm remembering him now that you've asked me about it yeah I took a few characters out or sometimes I combined characters if I had too many I would just make them one character to be less confusing yeah I always, um, I myself was writing a writing a book and I would like to ask what advice would you give to young authors? Ooh. Um, the easiest if you're in, you know, still writing is read. So my degree is not creative writing. Um, every good book, every good lesson I've learned has come from a book. And I really believe every book has a lesson if you're willing to learn, even if it's a book that you think is trash, because I, you know, we all read books we don't like, but then you can ask yourself, well, why didn't I like that book? What made me put it down? What made me so mad? Cause it's getting an emotion out of you for some reason. Um, or if you reread certain books, you can be like, why do I keep rereading this book even though I know the ending? What is it doing that's like making my brain light up that's making me want to come back to it? So I think the best thing you can do to learn good storytelling is read good stories, you know? 
and you can start to take things like I really like the world building here I really like the humor here I really like the way this romance makes me feel here and bring all those things into your own writing and the library is free so there's no you know limit to how many books you can read thank you yeah um, I don't want to procrastinate with doing anything so I was wondering how did you procrastinate Oh, like specifically? Currently, it's this horrible theme on my phone called Township. Oh, my God. Really <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> but the nice thing about Township is, like, you, you, I don't spend money, so, like, I can't play, because they want you to spend money to get to play more, and I'm like, well, I don't have any more money. Nope, not where I can, no more fake currency. It's like a weird little phone game, you guys. You build a farm and, like, grow mm -hmm. the farm and have little cows and chickens that you feed with anyway. That's my newest thing. Um, I like to go on walks. Like I really enjoy just taking my dog. In, I, I live in Arkansas, so it's called the natural state. We've got a lot of natural beauty, parks, rivers, lakes, and just going for a walk, putting in a podcast or an audiobook, and just walking around makes me really happy. Um, and then Real Housewives. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest with you all. Just trash reality TV that I need to just unplug totally. Um, the map that you illustrate in the book, did you make it? Um, other artists helped you to you make it? Other like authors or artists Arter, or any? Artists, artists. The map. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the map. Just Say, sorry? The map. Oh, the map, the map. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's a lovely artist named Virginia A-L-L-Y-N. She's on Instagram. She does a lot of maps for fantasy books, and so I gave her a really bad one and said, here you go, and she made a really nice one. <laughs> um, that's, I mean, I like to draw, but not map, map drawing and map making and cartography is a specific skill that I just do not have. Um, and so, and I told her kind of thematically what I wanted. She put some of the creatures and animals into the border, which I really appreciated because I didn't, I gave her the buy, but she took that and then made something nice of it. Um, but yeah, her name's she's on Instagram. Her name's Virginia Allen, and she's amazing. Thank you. Um, okay, so I already have a bound, right? mm -hmm. and the grease is so bad. So, mm -hmm. what is your skincare routine, please? Oh gosh, <laughs> it's all Fenty. It's all Fenty. Really? Um, I was not a skip hey. So again, we're being honest. Safe space. I thought skincare was um a um what would you call it? A scam. I thought it was a scam. I was like, I don't believe that if you put this on your skin, it will magically make your skin better. And I just didn't, didn't believe it. And then I, a few years ago, I was like, I'm going to try. And I wanted something very simple. And, uh, Rihanna Venti it has the, this, the kit. It's mm -hmm. one, two, three, and it's really easy. I don't have a 12 step routine. It's just wash my face, put some toner on, some moist SPF. I did not know and I'm mad about it now that black people do sunburn, oh do get, uh, can't actually are, are higher, more prone to get skin cancer because by the time we realize we have it, we're usually stage four. Um, so I'm big on putting sunscreen on now. Um, if nothing else, just putting some sunscreen on. But yeah, I, I feel you. Greasy. <laughs> I, I've not worked at McDonald's, but I was a greasy teenager. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just learning how to like, how to yeah. wash my face properly. <laughs> yeah. The grease gets really bad. It's and different environments too. Like Tucson, the air is really dry. And so I've noticed when I go to places where there's not as much humidity, I have to kind of adjust more moisture. Go figure. And then um, in Arkansas, we do not have that problem. And so like <laughs> not less moisture is fine. So yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so you worked on Beast of Prey for like a really long time. How many years did you say? Four. 20, uh, 2015, 2019, and then I got an agent. Then we sold it in 2020, worked on it some more, and it published in 2021. So six years in total so from, like, I, start to finish. So you'd say, like, I'm, I'm just wondering, so when you went through, like, revisions of your book, mm -hmm. did, like, any aspects of, like, your characters change? Mm. I think... I let myself, like with Ekon especially, like really leaned into who he was and like, because YA fantasy, a lot of the male characters do present a certain way. And I was like, maybe I should write him more like that. And I was like, that's not who Ekon really is. So being more authentic to who he really is, which is a nerd, just a sweet nerd. <laughs> um, yeah, I think he became more and more authentic with each draft. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so in page 13, 
and you write something about the body has to be taken to the ancestors good lands mm -hmm. um are there traditions or ceremonies that you or your family practice related with it so no that was a choice i made um all of the religious aspects all the gods in this book are totally made up i did not want to use anybody's real faith in a way that could be perceived as disrespectful. Now, there may be things that are similar by chance to real faiths, but I did not base it deliberately on any real religion or faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what made you want to write fantasy-related books or this genre specifically? I think you a lot of times end up writing what you read, and I just, as a kid, um, I have a really vivid image of being at the YMCA in like 2006 and everybody else was in the pool and I was in the corner in the shade reading a book and it was a fantasy book and I just like getting to escape like if if 2006 Atlanta Georgia is boring which it was to me at that time like I can just go read like Aragon or something and I can kind of transport to a world that is different and exciting and I yeah I think it's the transportive uh, quality of fantasy. And every time I try to write something that isn't fantasy, it becomes fantasy by mistake. So I have just learned that's my genre. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you were to write another book, what would it be and why? So I am writing another book. Um, I'm working on my fourth. So like in publishing everything, the time is weird. I finished Beasts of War last year and it just takes a long time to go to print and go through the stuff that it has to go through. So. I'm already writing book four. Uh, I'm not allowed to say what it is, but it's not Beasts of Prey. It's a totally different world. And it's, um, what can I say? It's a villain origin story, which I've always wanted to write. Oh my God. Like, I really love knowing how villains become villains and it's more mythos um, and incorporates monsters and stuff. But it's, it's definitely um, probably more violent and more spicy than Beasts of Prey, which I don't know how my grandma's gonna feel, but... <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I think I, I really like mythology and I really like taking monsters and subverting like what we think monsters are. So, yeah. Hopefully we can talk about it soon. <laughs> Is there any current favorite book that you're reading? Reading right now? We're, oh gosh. Oh gosh, I really like Sorcery of Thorns. It's a YA fantasy book. Um, warrior Librarian, that's how I'm gonna pitch that. It's so good. I also like Strange the Dreamer, which is also a Warrior Librarian book. <laughs> you can see the theme here. Um, I really like Little Thieves. It's a uh, Germanic YA fantasy um, with like a very messy, flawed girl. Um, oh gosh. This is hard. Oh, I just read uh, Starling House by Alex E. Harrow, and it's like romance and fantasy and mystery in like Southern Kentucky, like so also based in the real world. And like, I just, I really, I mean, I'm from the South, so I'm partial to Southern, Southern fantasy. Um, I just read that one pretty recently and really liked it. So I just threw like 10 titles at you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a big fear of like, letting my out and show Twitter, like, mm -hmm. how did you overcome it? Um, so Twitter's a trash dump at the moment, I know, but I used Twitter at the time. There's a great website called Critique Circle, and I like that one because you have to earn currency, like you earn coins by reading other people's work, and then when you have enough, then you can submit your work. And I like that because it's not just read my things, it's like you have to give and take. I think, and I think, you know, if you're looking for critique partners, being willing to read other people is, other people's work is a great, you know, doing the swap is a nice, fair way to find people. Um, I think Instagram has communities too. Goodreads, I think, has some as well. And then overcoming the fear, just finding people who are into what you're into. Like if you write paranormal, look for other paranormal fantasy authors who are gonna be excited about the stuff you're writing and, and offer nice things and constructive feedback. Yeah. I can't get over the fear. It's always going to be scary, but it's less scary with people who are like into what you're into. Thank you. Um, do you like have a favorite genre you adore reading? That I like adore reading. Oh, besides fant, I really like fantasy. Of course, um, I really like like historical fantasy. So when you draw from 
from real history. That's always fun. And I like historical fiction too, especially like ancient Rome, um, like circa gladi like gladiator esque stuff. There's a book called Mistress of Rome. It's a, a quartet. It's a series. And it's older now, but um, I really enjoyed those books and the Tudors. Anything that's set in the Tudors era, that absolutely messy. That era is so messy. Um, I really enjoy like Elizabethan, uh, King Henry VIII. Yes, any of that. Thank <laughs> you. If you have the opportunity, would you turn your book *Beast of Prey* into a movie? So, uh, *Beast of Prey* is in development to be a movie. Um, now. Hold on. <laughs> um, it's a cool thing to say and it's happening but what I like to tell people like I don't always lead with that because fantasy filmmaking takes forever so to answer your question yes I would love that but I'm also being realistic about how long it may take for that to happen um, Game of Thrones for reference came out in 96 and was not adapted until 2011 Oh. And that series is massively successful, but it still took forever. She, uh, Lee Bardugo, Shadow and Bone, which I also love her books. Um, that book came out, the first book came out in 2012. The adaptation didn't happen until 2022. When you're talking about big, epic fantasy with special effects, it's expensive and it takes a long time to do it. So I will be really happy when it happens, but I'm also prepared to, to wait. So I, I will be, I'm like kind of like tempering my emotion a bit about it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, have you ever abandoned writing and left it unfinished? And would you ever go back to writing it? Mm -hmm. Oh, like I told you I started at nine and didn't finish. Like I started a bunch of stories that I was just like, oh, I'm not inspired anymore. No. And I have a folder in my computer like called ideas. And so I'll jot stuff down and sometimes I'll come back to it. Sometimes I will just let it sit there and like, maybe this isn't the right time. So yeah, I do it all the time. But I think writing them down and just having it just in case is always good. Like even if it goes nowhere, Write it, get it on paper, and then you can always revisit it later. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, like, becoming a full-time author seemed, was, like, a very, like, sprung, sudden, like, change for you? Um, like not sudden, because I did, like, I got my book deal and didn't immediately quit my day job. I took some mm -hmm. time and planned it out um, for a few months. Like, again, I talked to, like, financial advisors and said, how much money do I need to live? And, like, kind of tried to figure out, like, can I responsibly do this mm -hmm. um so yeah it took a few months so i was just wondering so before you came an author what was like your goals or dreams oh i didn't i don't think i really had any tangible ones that, 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 was, that was kind of why i was unhappy because i worked in higher ed raising money for schools which was cool but it didn't make me happy it just i keep saying brain lighting up but it didn't make my brain light up it was just a job and so I was like, I guess my goal is to do the best I can at this job, but that doesn't really excite me or make me happy. I guess my goal was to one day write a book, you know, and not even get it published. I just wanted to finish something. So, yeah, at first that was my goal. Mm -hmm. um, so I also like to write stories online. Yes. I have done some of them, but most of them they're just like, um, so technically I just say, like, I like to read a lot too and watch movies and most of the time some of my stories I kind of related with some of the ideas from movies or books. Yeah. But I still feel like it's not enough. So like what uh, what do you do when you were feeling like when you were writing a book and you thought that like I don't think this is enough like. Like original. Uh -huh, like you like it but you just still feel like it's enough. Hmm. It's not enough. Um, ask, yeah, ask yourself, like, what's the most exciting thing that can happen? Your characters are sitting at a pub or something, and it's like, okay, well, what's the most unexpected or most exciting thing that can happen? Is it a dragon busting through the pub and destroying it, and one of them gets snatched, and when now the other character has to go get them? Because that, that adds a whole new plot point to the story. Or is it a witch walks in, and I'm thinking of all fantasy examples, is a witch walk in and, and, and entrance one of them and take them away, and now your character has to go get them? Like, I think of, like, what's the most unexpected and exciting thing, and what are the consequences of that happening? And that usually can, like, create a whole new Thing or adventure, sub adventure for my characters. Okay, I also write only about mythology too and fantasy. Yeah, I yeah. Wanted to. yeah. And with fantasy, it's great because you don't have, you don't have to be as plausible. With contemporary, you're a little bit more limited. But fantasy, it can be a witch, it can be a dragon, it can be a troll, it can be anything. 
um, within within the bounds of your world that you can kind of just throw in. And um, I do think Disney's really good at storytelling if you're learning like how to craft a story. Um, Disney's a really great example. Like I, I study Disney movies sometimes to see like how story to how to do good storytelling. So, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> I kind of want to start like like a little story of my own. Yeah. But the thing is, is like I have trouble just focusing on it, mm -hmm. and I keep having like other ideas that aren't related to it. Mm -hmm. And like, how do you like? Does that happen to you sometimes? Yeah, but I think one story always becomes the like of if if three things are exciting, one is always going to be more exciting than the other. And it's okay to write down idea B and C. But if A is the one that's calling to me the most, I'm going to pursue that. And if it ends up being nothing, then I can always go back to B and C. But I just like, what keeps you up at night? What's the one that is staying in your head? And I kind of follow my gut and go with, yeah, what is most exciting to me? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have to go anywhere soon? I'm not sure. Um, at one, we have another. Yeah. So I'll really be the time for assigning books. Aside from that, cool. Okay. All good. Sorry, um, if you had any advice to give to yourself, what would it be? Don't try to be perfect. Um, let yourself do something badly. It's okay. It'll only, it'll only get better from there. Okay, so if we only have time for signing books, we have a gift for you Ooh. from me and my book club. Right, with three. I like gifts. Right, so this is the back, and this is the front. Oh, we have yeah. a lot every month for the book we're reading, and that's the one we made for yours. Thank you. Oh, this is perfect. Yes. And I have this. Oh, this is our annotation guide, but we use the annotator book. Look at sure yours. Aesthetic. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I have color coded bookshelves at home. Like, I'm very into aesthetic. <laughs> yeah, no, we all. Oh, this is so cool. So we all started talking. We all wrote a thank you uh, on the back of it with our signed our names and everything. And um, these final gifts are our Book of the Month stickers that our favorite librarian makes every month for our book. This is so cool! <laughs> so this is going in my office. Um, <laughs> now what I have to decide is if I want this, because I'm going to hang it. Mm -hmm. I have to decide which side I want to hang it on. But this is so cool. Thank yeah, you guys. So cool. Well, maybe, if that's allowed. <laughs> <laughs> because I really like, like the notes, but I also really like the aesthetic. Thank you all so much. I've never seen a sticker with hope in my books. <laughs> I'm not gonna cry. <laughs> Thank you guys, really.